recorded um, session. So welcome to the um, Master of Chemical Sciences, um, Master of Chemical Sciences virtual poster session. Today we're going to have the students that are graduating in the spring and the summer presenting their capstones. We're very excited about that. You're going to have 10 minutes, including questions. Um, you can ask questions in the chat or after they're done. We ask that you are unmuted on, unless you are talking. Um, I apologize about my dogs. Apparently, they think it's a really nice thing to be barking at 8 in the morning. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. This session is recorded. Uh, I want to welcome. Oh, you're helping me, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I want to welcome, like, who's doing that? I'm going to welcome um, the ne nearly admitted students to the session. Thank you for tuning in. Obviously, the presenters and um, lab mates and also collaborators in the, of the uh, Penn and MCS program. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Our first presenter is Zhang Tae Song. He completed his capstone in Sarah Fakurai's lab. And um, after graduation, he was admitted to the Penn Chemistry PhD program. We're very excited about that. Uh, he's going to be sticking around. Yay. So go ahead and get started, Zhang Tae. Oh, um, let me share my screen. Nice. Can everybody see my screen or did it close? It's a minute. Okay. Sorry about the wait. How about now? Is it working now? Okay. So, all right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Young Tae Song, and um, as, as Anna Rita mentioned, I'm in a cry group. The work that I'm doing in, in Fakurai Group is investigating the development of wrinkle-like morphology in dipolacopolymer thin film. So I'll get started with, with what is blockopolymer. So blockopolymer is like a polymeric material that has more than two blocks of polymer chains attached to each other with chemical bonds. So like one chain can be what uh, a polymer, so like example, polystyrene, and another chain can be another polymer chain that can be like, I don't know, PES, PMMA, P2EP. And these two different polymer chains are attached to each other with chemical bond. The interesting thing about this block of polymer is that it can self-assemble. So let's say if there is another same polymer chain, AB block of polymer chain, if there's another block of polymer chain, A block can self-assemble and B block would like to self-assemble with the same B block. And this um, self-assembly self of block of polymer uh, chain can lead to uh, microphase separation. And you can control the volume fraction of each uh, block, of, block of the uh, polymer chain. So let's say, if I have a very short A block of block of polymer. Then it will gonna form the spherical microphase separation domain. Um, and then as I increase the length of A block, it will form cylinder, gyro, lamellae, and then now A block is longer than B block. So it's gonna form gyro again, cylinder, and sphere. So this um, self-assembly part, <coughs> self-assembly of block of polymer is very, a uh, fascinating subject for the nanotechnology because you can control the nanoscale morphology of the, like su such a thin film. Another thing that I want to introduce is uh, solvent vapor annealing. <clears throat> solvent vapor annealing is one of the like annealing technique that promotes the self assembly. So although I said the block of polymer can self assemble, uh, it needs some annealing process to initiate the self assembly. So. Um, solvent vapor annealing initiate this by exposing the thin film with the solvent vapor. So this is an AFM image of uh, AB, AB block of polymer, thin film, and this is without solvent vapor annealing. So after some time with solvent vapor annealing, um, such as 300 seconds, um, this, this is the same film, but now it has a specific morphology development. 
now AB block is um, self-assembled. And in this case, it's a the melee structure that is standing up. Um, it is um, out of plane, the melee structure, and then the melee thickness is shown here around like 100 nanometers. So uh, experimental design is that I use polystyrene block, poly to vinyl pyridine, so shortened PS, P2VP block of polymer. And I made a polymer solution with this block of polymer and then cast those polymer solution on top of silicon oxide substrate and then spin cast it. This spin cast is a uh, block of polymer thin film is now then solvent vapor and yield. And substrate is placed on top of some, some block and solvent is placed uh, on the bottom so that the substrate and then solvent is not directly touching each other. And then I use atomic force microscopy, AFM, to obtain the image of it, and then use Gideon software to process those images. So um, these are PSP2VP block of polymer thin films around like 140 nanometers. And I want to mention this is in 20 by 20 micrometer size. This is a three by three micrometer size. And I, I, yeah, this is the same film, three, around 300 seconds and 300 seconds. So I took two different size scale of images to see uh, this is three by three. So this shows a really specific um, intrinsic property of block of polymer self-assembly. But with the larger scale, 20 by 20 micrometer size, I can see the longer and larger scale um, morphological development. So as you can see, the uh, solvent vapor annealing time goes from zero seconds, 100 seconds, 300 seconds to up to 1800 seconds. You can see this little um, wrinkle like morphology is developing on 300 seconds and it's like growing as time is increasing. And with these five images, I did something called power spectrum density function. So basically this is a Fourier transform of the lateral autocorrelation function. This is very mathematic heavy. I don't really want to go deep into that. Um, so basically, power spectrum density function is showing something about characteristic length scale of this uh, morphological development. X-axis is in Q, Y-axis is in intensity. So Q is in reciprocal domain. Reciprocal domain is inversely proportional to the real lateral length. So high Q means it's very short lateral length, and then low Q means it's larger scale um, uh, length. So at high Q, there is a specific this peak. And if, you, if I can uh, calculate this Q to the real lateral length, L is about like 108 nanometers. And 108 nanometers is um, same as this um, uh, Lemele thickness of this block of polymer. But I want to focus with this uh, low Q small bumps that is gradually increasing in intensity as solvent vapor annealing time goes, but is decreasing with Q. So decreasing with Q means it's increasing with the lateral length feature. So the conclusion is that as solvent vapor annealing time increases, the larger scale wrinkle-like morphologies such as this are developing. Uh, we are still working on why is this the case. Um, so we're speculating that the maybe rapid solvent evaporation after solvent vapor annealing may cause this wrinkle-like uh, features. And another theory is that there are different uh, adsorption rate with uh, polystyrene P2P to the silicon oxide substrate. So this might contribute to this wrinkle-like feature. So feature research can be done with like uh, controlling the drying rate, the slower drying rate for solvent removal. Here's the reference. That's all for my poster. So if you have any question, I'll accept that. Thank you so much for, for giving us just a snippet of your project. I know it's hard to summarize in such a short time. Um, is there any questions for Hamte? A quick question. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, like, um, like which area your project can be applied. I'm, I mean, like, what's your application? So the application. So, um, block of polymer is already really applied to this nanotechnology because you can clearly see the nanoscale morphology. 
So this mm -hmm. is a lamellar feature, but you can control with the cylinder making features, uh, sphere making features. But to do that, you need to go through some kind of annealing process. I use solvent vapor annealing, but there are thermal annealing and different annealing process too. So with solvent vapor annealing, with this, I see the larger scale wrinkle-like features. This is uh, some uh, maybe unwanted feature that scientists want. So I want to control or erase or maybe like even enhance this wrinkle-like feature to control the surface morphology of the thin film. Okay, Did I? Thank you. Okay. You stole my question, Young. Young Han. <laughs> I was like, I'm not fully understand this whole project still. <laughs> so will you say this is more of like a basic type of yeah. understanding your real type of project? Young yes, I, I, I would say so. Because my original project was not about this. It was about the deep wetting experiment of a thin film. So if I do uh, annealing process for very long, this thin film will eventually de-wet. That was my original project. But as I do the project, I saw these wrinkle-like features and, and Dr. Fakra I think it's very cool and I thought it's very cool too. So I switched my project in the middle part. So mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Thank um, you. Um, we're very excited. And for those that you just tune in, remember that tomorrow at 3 p.m. we'll be showing the, uh, we'll be announcing the uh, awardee for the MCS Capstan Award. We had three entries and we'll be announcing it then. It's still a secret for now. So moving on, um, we have Yung Han Gao. Um, she completed her capstone at, in Professor Malouk's lab. She's from the Materials Inorganic Concentration. And her next step after graduation is to return to her home country and pursue a career in uh, materials chemistry. Um, I just want to say before she presents, feel free to zoom in your posters if you, if you think you can and you should so people can see it better. Um, if, if, if you want or you can. Um, so take it away, Yung Han. Okay, thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Yung Han from Malu Group. My project is effect of the anchoring groups on the photostability of resilient polypyridyl synthesizers. Just feel free to ask me any questions. To start my presentation, I will share you why I want to do this project. Carbon dioxide is a primary greenhouse gas emitted through human activities such as burning of oil, gas, deforestation. And it accounts around 80% of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And how, how the uh, uh, emissions of carbon dioxide change over time. Uh, and this figure shows the change from the mid 18th to today. We can see that the emissions of carbon dioxide emitted uh, increased uh, year by year and they haven't reached their peak through today. So it's like using solar power to generate fuel is a good choice to reduce, to reduce the carbon dioxide. So in this project, we're using solar power to generate hydrogen in water splitting system is somehow a sustainable approach to produce energy from renewable energy resource. Over the past decade, the Malo group has been focusing on using the water splitting dye sensitized photoelectrochemical cells. As the structure is shown in figure three, we can see that uh, the, the cell can absorb visible light and drive catalytic reactions to generate hydrogen and oxygen from water by using the molecular synthesizers. As shown this figure, Water is oxidized and the anion side of the cell to form oxygen and the protons are reduced to hydrogen and the cathode part. A small external bias voltage is applied to drive the overall redox reaction. And the anion side has attracts lots of interest and dominates research activities because there are four electron, uh, four electron um, reactions. And the anode set is what I will focus in this project. Because the complexity of the, of the cell, each component can affect the conversion efficiency of the cell. So like every component should be understood. 
And one of the primary factors is the property of the dye and shown here. And the idea dye requires not only a stable binding mode to the TiO2 surface, but also a good photo injection rate from the dye's excited states to the TiO2 conduction band, shown in this figure. And the anchoring groups on the four positions of the bipyridine ligands on the dye is uh, one of the major factors that design those properties. And the carboxylate groups or phosphorylate groups are commonly used in those sensitizers. As we can see in the experimental design, um, I designed three sensitizers. The first sensitizer contains phosphonate groups. The second sensitizer contains carboxylate groups. And sensitizer three contains both. Uh, according to previous studies, it has been confirmed that the sensitizer with phosphonate groups can have a good photostability bind to TiO2 surface, while the sensitizer with carboxylate groups can give a good photo injection yield. So it like that if I can um, insert both anchoring groups, my sensitizer can have both properties with good photostability and also good photo injection yield. And how can I make my sensitizers? And the right side, I show the three steps to obtain sensitizer one with phosphonate groups. And we can see my sensitizer has a symmetric structure. So usually the outer unit contain phosphonate groups will be sensitized firstly, as then coupled with the inner five carbon chain linker to achieve the target structure. So typically three steps can lead to the target structure. And after obtaining my sensitizers, I would prepare my photo anode. So I draw three steps to illustrate the process of the photo anode preparation. The first step is deposit the TiO2 nanoparticles to the FTO glass. And then I dissolve my sensitizer in the methanol. And this is the solvent of the sensitizer because my sensitizer usually have the resilient two plus ions. So it typically in the red orange cup in the red orange color in the solution. And after obtaining my solution, I soak my uh, electrodes to the sensitizers. And this is the sensitized electrodes. As you can see that the effective area is one centimeter square and it's in red orange color. And this is due to the uh, dark red, red orange color of my sensitizers. So after I obtain my sensitized electrodes, I would do the photostability measurements. One of the important factors affect my performance of my sensitizers. And the photostability measurements was done by using this, by using this system. The blue box will contain different pH buffer. I using pH, pH 4.9 and pH 6.9 as my buffer in these measurements. And at the left side, the L the blue LED light will directly onto the electrodes and the irradiation usually take around two hours. And the last step is the theoretic calculations. Apart from the experimental design, I using the DFT calculation to further support my experimental design. Uh, this, is, uh, the, this part, I, I want to find uh, the interactions between the TiO2 surface and my sensitizer, such as the uh, binding strength, binding energy. So the sensitizer one, sensitizer one was firstly optimized and those are the conditions. And I haven't done all the calculations. Here are the results and discussion part. The, uh, the photo stability measurements in those projects are usually, are usually, usually monitored by using the UVV spectroscopy. And behind this, behind the spectroscopy, the bl lambert law is the main principle behind this spectroscopy. There is usually a linear relationship between the concentration of the, electro of the sensitizer on the electrodes and the absorbance. And the absorbance usually decrease over time, as you can see from figure A, B, C in both figure six and figure six, seven. The absorbance decreases over time over time as I plot from the black to red. Um, 
And the changes in the absorbance in this project usually means the desorption of the sensitizers from the TiO2 surface. And the larger amount of desorption means the poor photostability. And the poor photostability is usually caused by the poor performance of the anchoring groups. So by using the absorbance spectroscopy, we can illustrate the performance of anchoring groups. Figure A, B, C represents sensitizer one, two, three respectively. As we can see in pH 4.9, the sensitizer one with all, all phosphonate groups shows a small amount of the changes in the absorbance. While for, for sensitizer two with carboxylate anchoring groups in B, it shows a large amount of the decrease in absorbance. And the figure D represents absorbance changes over time for three sensitizers. The black plot for sensitizer one uh, shows the slow rate, slow rate change in absorbance for sensitizer one. And the red color for sensitizer two with carboxylic groups shows, shows that the sensitizer two has a large amount of change in absorbance and also the most quick, the most rapid one change. Um, so in this figure, we can see that the photostability for the sensitizer one is the best and for sensitizer two with carboxylic group, it has a poor photostability. The same results will be obtained from pH 6.9 that sensitizer one has less change than sensitizer two and three. Uh, after obtaining the photostability of the sensitizer one, two, and three, we can illustrate that the phosphonate anchors can enhance the photostability of sensitizers on TiO2 electrodes compared to the carboxylate groups. And for the geometry optimization of sensitizer one, here is the uh, optimized the geometry of my sensitizer one. Uh, what we most care about in this part is the binding mode through carboxylate or phosphonate groups. As shown in this figure, the phosphonate groups are in red and orange color and how they bind to the TiO2 surface like the binding manners or the number of phosphonate groups that can bind to the TiO2 surface should be further understand to support my experimental data. And in conclusion, sensitizer one with all phosphonate groups shows the best photostability among three sensitizers from pH 4.9 to pH 6.9 under the constant irradiation. And also the phosphonate anchors can enhance the photostability on TiO2 electrodes. And then my future direction will include a uh, measure the photo injection yield from the sensitizer its excited states to the TiO2 conduction band. Because uh, uh, photo injection yield is another important factor that can determine the overall performance of my sensitizers. And this is our group picture. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is a very exciting project. Um, do we have any questions? Great job. Do you have any questions? So I have a question. Um, those molecules don't seem, it's, they don't seem that easy to make. What, do you run into any challenges making the molecules, especially the ones that are not symmetrical? Oh yeah, like for the sensor, for the sensor tender three, this is not symmetry. Like uh, one side is phosphonic group and one side is carboxylate group. So like I should make one side and then do the purification and using the MR and uh, mass spectroscopy to confirm my structure. And the first step is I synthesize a resilient complex with two bipyridine ligands, substituted with the carboxylate groups. And then I cup with my five carbon chain linker. The last step is to add some resilient complex with two bipyridine ligands. However, at this time, the bipyridine ligand will be substituted with the phosphonate groups. And one step by one step, I can obtain my target structure. But in the process, the most important is that every step my crystal should be purified. Like my like my reagent for the next step should be like should be like hundred not hundred percent purified, but 
almost no, no like almost should be purified by column and uh, like no influence for the next step to increase my yield. And what were some of the side products, do you know, when you were having problems with your reactions? A side product is probably like the uh, reaction ratio, because like sometimes the bacterial lincoln will not cop to the resilient complex, or sometimes the resilient complex will be hard to cop to the five carbon chain linker. So like I should monitor my reaction in the process Okay, thank you. I know I know you, all of you guys work extra hard because you were starting your project and COVID hit. So all of you had to make adjustments to your projects. And, and some of you got like later in the lab because master students were not allowed in the labs for a little while. So I really wanna commend all of you for the great work that you guys did. Thank you so much, Yuhan. Any other question? Yeah, go ahead. And I think we are mute or oh, no. Any any other questions? Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I cannot Can hear. Just, like, Can't put it it Just put it in the chat and I'll read it for you. Thank you so much. You need to apply a voltage to drive the catalysis. If you know, can you please tell me what is the small voltage mole of oxygen generated? Oh yeah, like actually uh, the uh, research on this project only like, uh, we only start from the anode side and we haven't started using like voltage and also we haven't done the cathode side. So if there is still a long way to obtain the whole project. So still we cannot know the voltage that we probably need for the, like for the experiment, but we, we are sure that there should be a voltage here. Does that answer your question, Shiv? Thank you so much. Thank you, Yaya, Yonghan. Yeah. Um, and also, do you know the turnover frequency of the catalyst? Still don't know, cause like we have a, like applied to the real system. We only measure like, like stability, like photo injection yield. We haven't done lots of work on the whole system. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So our next presenter is Deanna Arndt. Um, she completed her capstone project in Professor Murray's lab. Um, Deanna is, and, and she was one of those people that um, had to switch her project pretty quickly. She originally had an experimental project and then she came up with this more computational project um, that she's gonna show. I, again, I wanna encourage you when you're talking about certain figures or you wanna zoom in or something to be able to see them better. Um, so Deanna will be looking for a job in industry after she graduates. So take it away, Deanna. So good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Works good. All right, perfect. So as Anarita said, I've been working in the Murray lab for my capstone project. And my project has been focused on developing a software to better analyze transmission electron microscopy or TEM images of the nanoparticle systems that are coming out of the Murray lab. So as a basis for my project, I first looked at this commonly used software, it's called ImageJ, which aims to segregate particles from the background of TEM images. Uh, into these measurable shapes so you can find size information about the system. However, I've often found that if you use ImageJ, it often misidentifies particles. 
Um, and this is because the separation algorithms are pretty simplistic. The software uses a pretty simplistic intensity thresholding system where an intensity threshold is set and any pixel above this threshold is the background, anything below is considered a particle. So this process often aggregates particles, you overestimate the average particle area. So to address these limitations, my first objective was to come up with some more robust algorithms for um, separating those particles from the background of the TEM image. Then my second objective was to encompass these new algorithms in a MATLAB application dashboard that would help the user to choose better parameters for analyzing their specific TEM image by providing some sort of indicator for the reliability of the results coming out of the application. And I'm calling these quantitative results or indicator of the reliability of the results confidence intervals here. So for my first objective, instead of using this thresholding system to segregate particles from the background, I'm using a system of radiating intensity profiles, where for every particle, you have intensity profiles moving from the center point of the particle to the edge of the image. And the reason for this is that every intensity profile has a position where the profile has passed from the particle into the background of the image. That location is then an edge or a point along the edge of the particle. So if I can identify that position for every intensity profile, all of the edge points add together to form a particle perimeter, effectively separating the particle from the background of the image. So I've determined that the area of increase from the particle to the background of the image is where that location of the edge point is. So actually, to isolate those areas of increased intensity in the intensity profiles, I have developed differential profiles that have these positive peaks indicating those areas of increased intensity. I then identified the edge peak using a reference peak that's similar to the thresholding regime used in ImageJ. But you can see that the reference peak here, which kind of matches up to the second blue peak, isn't in exactly the same position. So this indicates that my process is likely a little bit more precise than the processes used in ImageJ. So next, I developed this quantitative indicator of the reliability of the position of these edge peaks. So for each of the differential profiles, I find the amplitude of the edge peak here, as well as the noise level of the profile. I then take the proportion of each of these values to the maximum amplitude of the profile and average the two attributes into a single proportion. I'm actually reporting these intervals as percentages, where 100% would be a completely reliable edge point position that would come from a profile that has no noise and a single peak. Then these intervals can be averaged together to find the reliability of a single particle perimeter or the image as a whole. So for my second objective, I then encompass these algorithms in this MATLAB application dashboard, which you can see here. So in this case, the user can use these algorithms by setting several different parameters, such as whether they want to find the area or the diameter of their particles, whether it's a bright field or dark field image, or setting a confidence minimum. And this means that any particle that does not reach this confidence minimum is not included in analysis and it's outlined in red instead of green. So I have found in my experiments using confidence minimums, uh, different trials with different confidence minimums, that these confidence intervals could act as a feedback loop to help me choose better procedures for analyzing my images. So for instance, for this rhombus system shown down here, I decreased the confidence minimum from 55% down to 40%. And when I did this, I found that in general, the particles with a higher confidence interval were oriented to the top left of the image. And so this orientation then indicated a hidden background gradient that was making it more difficult to analyze particles in the bottom right portion of the image where the contrast was not as great. 
So because I found these background gradients, I realized that the user is probably going to want to do some pre-processing of their images to sort of maximize the information that is available in analysis. However, anytime that you do modify the information in a data set, of course, it adds this data manipulation bias incorporated in the results. So I also wanted to conduct some experiments to see how the pre-processing regimes that I included in my application would affect the results. Specifically, I looked at these spherical system and found the average diameter of each of these particles. So I included two different pre-processing regimes. The first one includes saturating a percentage of the top and bottom pixels of the image to increase the contrast. And the second one uses a Gaussian kernel to smooth any background gradients. And I also included a regime that combines those two pre-processing algorithms. So in order to test this, I looked at eight different images of the same spherical system here using the pre-processing regimes given in table one right here. So some of the trends that I found were that when you increase the contrast, this always decreases the average diameter, but it also increases the image confidence, which is a good thing. In contrast, I found that flattening tends to decrease the image confidence, which is not what you want. But I did find that if you combine the two regimes, you are still able to increase the image confidence and remove those background gradients, which helps you to identify even more particles. But because increasing the contrast does decrease the average diameter, it's important when reporting these results to divulge what pre-processing you used to show that you may be underestimating the average diameter slightly from the original image. So in conclusion, I found that my MATLAB application can effectively segregate those particles from the background. And it also provides more information about the data in the image using those confidence intervals that, that can help you choose a better parameter system or procedure. I also anticipate that this process could be used for other types of data sets like SEM images. You would just have to change a little bit of the code there. Also for analyzing spaces in between particles rather than purely that area of the particles themselves. And finally, I just want to thank everyone in my lab for you know, having so many amazing suggestions and all of their assistance, and especially Austin and Katie who provided me with these images um, so that I could complete my analysis. So now I am happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Any questions from the group? You can unmute yourself, you can write them in the chat. So, so what, what will be the next step for this project? So I think that the, well, okay, the first, the first step that I would suggest doing is that I'm not a computer programmer. So my code is not very efficient and it takes a while to run. So I think that if this program was to be you know, developed further, you would get a real computer scientist to come in and <laughs> rewrite the code so that it's a little faster. That would be really easy. I just don't know too much about computer programming. So after that step, you can add so many different functionalities that are just sort of add-ons to this process using the radiating intensity profiles. So things like being adding a couple of algorithms that help you analyze SEM images would be a lot better or as I mentioned, uh, that the distances between particles to express some information about the packing of the particles, I think that would be really interesting there as well. Well, thank you. This seems very exciting and hopefully somebody will take over and yeah. run with it. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. So our next uh, speaker is Jeremy McAndrew. He completed or is completing his journey he is completing his uh, capstone in Professor Dam in the OLS lab. He's working with some catalysis. Um, Jeremy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thanks so much. Um, let me just uh, share my screen and I can begin my presentation. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
Sorry, I just lost my tab for a second. Everything's going all over the place. Where the heck? There it is. Can you guys see my screen? We can see your screen, but we can see a portion now. Thank you so much. Phil. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. so hi, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Jeremy McAndrew. I'm currently, I'm working in the Mendiola lab in, uh, in some catalysis, and I will begin my presentation. So the steam cracking process is a process by which the petrochemical industry de dehydrogenates saturated hydrocarbons into their, an their unsaturated analogs. These unsaturated analogs, or olefins, how we know them, are utilized to produce products having extensive uses, such as the production of adhesives, elastomers, and polymers, all of which make modern life possible. However, a great disadvantage is plague the steam cracking process, as it is extremely energy intensive. It requires very high temperatures, up to 800 degrees Celsius, and is very, very unselective due to the radical nature of the dehydrogenation producing multiple products. And this is going to exacerbate the cost due to separation. This process explores the possibility of converting the stoichiometric homologation of already existing inexpensive olefins with the transient species dicyclopentadienyl titanium thilidine into a catalytic process. So, to go into a slight bit of history, uh, back in 1978, Tebby and co-workers reported the stoichiometric homologation of ethylene to propylene. Uh, they added a methylene unit to an alkenyl chain at mild conditions. Uh, this uh, transient species one can be genera generated through two synthetic routes, either by the activation of the Tebby reagent with a Lewis base or upon heating potassium reagents. Um, converting this already known process into a stoichiometric system, I'm sorry, uh, into a uh, catalytic system involves the addition of a triphenylmethylene phosphorine illid in situ. Uh, the cycle, the proposed cycle, how this could work is as follows. So uh, step one, this uh, transient species one transient species undergoes a two plus two cycloaddition with an olefin. In the example here, I have ethylene to a four-membered, to form a four-membered metallocycle A. Uh, then intermediate A can go undergo beta hydride elimination to form an allele hydride species B. Step three, species B then undergoes reductive elimination to form C to simultaneously expel the homologation product, in this case propylene. In this step, uh, the titanium-4 complex is reduced to titanium-2. Uh, the titanium-2 product is expected to decompose through multiple mechanisms under stoichiometric conditions. This decomposition is, um, is irrelevant to the project of ti what titanium-2 will go to. Um, up to this point, steps one, two, and three are all recapitulations of the stoichiometric reaction. However, what would be new and what I would ultimately be trying to do is step four the addition of the triphenylmethylene phosphorine illid would oxidatively add to, I will oxidatively add the methylene unit to complex C to form a methylene Lewis base addict D. This is, a, this is the fundamental step in being able to regenerate the titanium methylene species. This step has been, this step has been, uh, has literature precedent with and has been used with uh, divalent zirconium and titanium complexes. Then uh, finally, step five, uh, the ligand association of the triphenylphosphine regenerates the active catalyst to close the cycle out. So um, whenever I'm gonna be doing uh, any sort of uh, experimental trials with this, uh, the olefin I used instead of ethylene was one octene due to its experimental availability uh, non-volatility as a liquid at room temperature and its non-toxicity. Therefore, any trials I run of this reaction is expected to produce the homologated product of 2-methyl-1-octene. So in general, this project can be divided into three main objectives. Um, simple enough. So one is the synthesis of the product standard 2-methyl-1-octene 
independent of homologation or reference to determine future results. Two, the confirmation of the stoichiometric homologation of one octene to two methyl one octene via species one that can prove that this uh, stoichiometric uh, reaction can work in the first place. And three, the attempt at the actual catalytic cycle using the triphenylmethylene phosphorine ILID. So the synthesis of the product standard was very mainly straightforward enough. This 2-methyl-1 octene was synthesized via Witte uh, chemistry with 2-octanone and conveniently enough, the same ILID I would be working with in the catalytic system to uh, form uh, the 2-methyl-1 octene. And then this was further uh, separated via fractional distillation. Uh, it was not completely uh, distilled 100%. As of you can see, there's a little bit of TH, residual THF signals in, in this uh, spectrum. But um, looking at this, I think it's a, definitely a really decent standard to which to which to measure future results. And then um, again, that was confirmed through the proton NMR. So after confirming that the 2-methyl-1 octane product is, has been established, it was time to confirm the demonstration of a stoichiometric homologation. So this is where I uh, ran into a snag in the actual project where I'm actually running into a little bit of trouble because under 13 conditions, I was not able to confirm the stoichiometric product using one octane. So the first reaction performed was the Tebi homologation using pyridine as a Lewis base, um, all using stoichiometric amounts. However, um, no product was formed, which led me to introduce an increase in the temperature from, from uh, room temperature to 50 degrees Celsius uh, into the system to keep everything and keeping everything else constant. Uh, that was also unsuccessful. So I would take that and say, okay, well, maybe it has to react uh, more. So I gave more time to react, still no, uh, still no luck. And then what I would do is introduce even more, more heat into the system. Uh, so I would take it from 50 degrees into 80 degrees to see if that would work. And unfortunately, it did, that did not seem to work. So then I decided to run the same reaction, but without using the, well, without the Lewis base activation, as this homologation is also reported without the Lewis base, um, because the original paper does report this uh, reaction without uh, Without the active, without the Lewis base activation, and other paper papers report that it will enhance its reactivity with the Lewis base. So without the Lewis base, still I was not able to confirm any product, and um, I went through the same sort of temperature changes and time changes, and I was still unable to, still unable to get this to run. And then after my failures with the Tebi reagent, I decided to use the Potassus reagent which is in some respect more convenient than using the Tebi reagent because even though the potassium is light sensitive, it has to be reacted in the dark. Uh, the <clears throat> the potassium doesn't need, need any sort of um, external chemical activation. Uh, all it needs is roughly 66 degrees to activate it into the titanium methylidine. Um, so running these reactions with the potassium and one octane still yield similar results to the Tebi reagent. Um, something noteworthy to mention is that, um, that were to mention using the Tebi that during these runs at roughly 80 degrees Celsius, that some chemistry did happen in, in which the oligomerization of one octane took place around the signal of this NMR around 5.4 ppm. So there's the, uh, therefore some chemistry did happen. However, not in the direction I tried to make it go because originally I would have thought that this sort of signal would have residual would have um, resonated with the um, some of the vanillic hydrogens as if a, a switch from two signals to one would have been a very good sign. However, uh, it, it seemed that even in the baseline that octane was still present and then no other signs of the homologated product took place. So taking so this um, it was it has been kind of unfortunate. But taking this project, um, the future directions would be <clears throat> as follows, is that the stoichiometric homologation 
it still has to be confirmed. So the first thing I would do is that I would purify all the starting materials. Um, not only would I just confirm them by NMR, but I would actually collect crystal structures of both the Tebi and the Potassus reagent to further confirm their structures. Um, along with this, I would make sure not only to use a temperature near around 80 degrees Celsius to avoid any sort of oligomerization of the olefin I use, in this case, octane. Uh, I would definitely switch the substitute the one octane for something for a more volatile olefin. Um, for example, either one hexene or even I would use ethylene most likely because that would be um, mimicking the seminal paper exactly. Um, it, it is possible that the one octane could have been could have been long enough and the aliphatic chain could have somewhat interrupted or disrupted any sort of uh, re um, could have interfered in the activation of the olefin moiety. And if that still did not work, uh, I would be searching for, I, I probably would go for search for an alternative titan titanium complex to use. Um, <clears throat> possibly a titanium complex that was possibly more, or a titanium ethylene that was able to be more electron rich that could maybe donate its electrons better would, and to undergo this two plus two cycle addition. Um, I would also probably uh, research from zirconium complexes as uh, they would possibly have a similar chemistry, be both being group four metals. Anyway, hey, I appreciate you guys uh, taking a chance to listen to me. And if there are any, if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to field them. Thank you so much. Uh, great job. It looks like it's been quite challenging. Uh, yeah, a little bit. I think. I think the biggest thing. I think the biggest thing was the um. The, the, the confirmation of the stoichiometric reaction definitely was um, <clears throat> unfortunate, I think. And then that's when I really started thinking about where I could possibly take this. Okay. Um, I definitely, what, what I mean, what I definitely learned is, is that a lot of these procedures that we learn or a lot of the procedures that have to be brought out are not just kind of simple recipes that you like bring into a kitchen and take step by step. That yeah. A lot of times there's like a trick to them and um, that's what I'm learning very fast. So, okay. um, yeah. Thank you. I have, uh, Yonghan has a question. She raised her hand and I think Dr. Rapp also unmuted himself. I don't know if he has a question. So go ahead and, and ask whatever, ask away. Yeah, a, good, a great job. Um, but I'm wondering like in your reaction, like all the conditions, like there is, no products or some product inside, but the amount is too small to be detected by the proton NMR. Cause like I used to miss the same problem that my product cannot be detected mm -hmm. by the proton NMR cause the amount is too small to be detected. So I'm wondering like if you probably can switch to other spectroscopy to detect your products or no products in, the, in your reaction. Yeah, so I think it's a <clears throat> it's a pretty good question. Um, I did float the idea around of possibly using mass spectrometry to use this. I mean, mass spec, mass spec to possibly detect any sort of um, and any sort of uh, structure or any sort of product I could have made. And <clears throat> under discussion with like lab members, I did run one reaction with the mass spec. However, mm -hmm. I don't think it gave gave me any sort of result that. Um, like a, a definitive sort of result that I can say I can officially confirm I have my product yeah. um, because I know that the homologated product doesn't really have a really easy ionizable moiety to it, which could kind of make trying to run two methyl one octane through mass spec yeah. pretty difficult. But regards to your other question using maybe a small amount was formed. I definitely, we definitely did think of that. <clears throat> And any sort of detection of, of the homologated product was not only looked for in the macro sense, but it was also looked for in the micro sense. And the fact that I was looking in the baseline of a lot of these spectra to see some sort of <clears throat> product. And there were some really early hopes that I did make it mm -hmm. because I did, uh, uh, I did detect some, uh, <clears throat> what is it? I did detect some expected signals where I thought they would be and were depending 
for, compared to what the NMR of 2-methyl-1-octene is, I expected, I, I saw some of those signals where I expect them to be. However, mm -hmm. the integrations really did not, I did, did not um, really uh, did mesh out that well um, because I would able to, and, and if that were to happen, it would seem really, um, it would seem really strange because most of the reactions I ran were stoichiometric amounts. There's only one reaction I ran with in excess one octane, which was, um, it, there's only one <clears throat> uh, reaction where I ran it in excess, mm -hmm. where I would have expected to see only small amounts in the baseline, but even run at stoichiometric reactions, it mm -hmm. did, e e or even running them at stoichiometric amounts, <clears throat> Even I, I, we really didn't see any sort of uh, tangible physical evidence we can actually see to say, hey, this actually worked. So, mm. so in to your question, yes, uh, I de we definitely did think about the amount made could have been very little, like trace amounts, but you know we were also looking at the baseline. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Rapp. Do you have a question for Jeremy? Yes, good morning. I enjoyed your presentation. I have two small questions. One is you mentioned that you did not distill completely and that the solvent remained. Can you explain why that is a problem and why that happens? And second, how do you select titanium as the catalytic metal for this process? Are there other metals that could be tried? So yeah, well, <clears throat> of course, so the, um, the, I think you're referring to my Wittig reaction of the 2-methyl-1-octene. And I mentioned that there's a residual amount of THF that was used, or there is a residual amount of THF that uh, remained in this spectrum I have up my poster. Um, yeah, the reason why I decided to use it the way it was, was because I didn't want to risk boiling off my actual, I, I didn't want to risk distilling off my actual, uh, uh, my actual product. And uh, we definitely ran through the fractional distillation. We could definitely see the amount of the sort of THF signals that were decreasing. And uh, at that point, when we looked at this spectrum, it definitely seemed like at this point that we can easily identify where the THF peaks were and say, okay, these are definitely the THF peaks. And we're easily to able to identify the, um, able to identify the sort of um, <clears throat> the other homologation peaks or the the uh, the aliphatic peaks. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, with your question about the titanium species, I did I, I did think what other sorts of um, titanium species I could use. And again, I did mention possibly zirconium because uh, they are both group four metals, which can also group four metals that can. Um, uh, possibly exhibit very similar sorts of chemistry. Uh, possibly using this sort of titanium ethylidine, I would want to just push the push this sort of uh, equilibrium to the right. So I want to be able to do everything I could to sort of really uh, encourage that two plus two cycle of addition. So I was thinking something possibly electron donating, maybe something that was more like maybe instead of using like CP on the Tebby, it could have been like CP prime, something more electron donating that could somewhat push that electron density and encourage it to react. I, I hope to answer your question, Professor Rapp. Um, Thank you. If there are no other questions, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, this first part of the uh, poster session was more for physical and inorganic and catalysis type of work. And we're going to switch gears a little bit now towards the organic and biological uh, projects. Um, thank you so much for everybody who um, was here. Uh, our next presenter is Tejung Chu. He completed his capstone project in Professor Amos Smith lab. Um, he got accepted into the Penn Chemistry PhD program, so he'll be staying on campus for a while. So uh, to June, do you wanna, I think you're around. Yeah, I, you wanna take it away. I believe you are um, 
your co-host. And he chose to give short, uh, a very short presentation with slides. So take it away. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Mayo. So as uh, I introduced, I'm Ta Jun Cho and in the Smith School working on the HRA project. So uh, my topic we will be in a synthesis of BN3117, uh, which is a small molecule targeting the HIV virus and the development of the concise synthesis. <clears throat> uh, so first is the brief uh, introduction of the HIV, uh, the human immune deficiency virus. Uh, almost 33 million people died of IIT-related illness. And in 2019, uh, almost 70, 700,000 people died uh, from related illness. And around 1.7 million uh, people <clears throat> were newly infected. So the current therapy approach uh, involved uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy, uh, which combined with uh, three to four uh, kind of drugs targeting the HIV during the different life cycle of the HIV infections, uh, which can achieve suspension of the HIV virus uh, with no risk of infected others. Uh, however, there are some problems remaining. The most important is that uh, this therapy uh, failed to deplete the latent viral reservoirs uh, because uh, in our body, some of the infected cells can remain inactive and uh, this uh, HART therapy they cannot target and animate uh, this unactive virus. So once you stop using these therapies, uh, this virus uh, may go active again and increase the H HIV virus in your body level again. So therefore, uh, this therapy are not active. Uh, so next, I'm going to talk about the mechanism of the HIV infections. Uh, so this is the whole cell, uh, the, the main target of the HIV in our body, uh, the helper, helper T cells. So the infection starts with the binding of the amyotrophin on the virus membranes, uh, which consists of three subunits of the GP120, like a plate of flour, and three subunits of the GP21, uh, GP41, that's like like a stock of a flower that attached to the members of the HIV virus. <clears throat> then the GP120 subunit on the HIV virus can then attach to the CD4 receptor on the T cell, host T cells and dramatically change the conformation of the street subunit in GP120 and over the uh, co-receptor uh, co bonding site CCR4s. Uh, the correspond corresponding bonding site on the uh, GP120, uh, which can bind to the core receptor 3 r 4 or to X3R4 on the T host T cells. And then uh, these two, uh, after this four binding is formed, uh, these receptors can then drag the virus toward the T cells and form a few form a uh, holes and I can transport the capsid uh, into <clears throat> the T cells. And then followed by a series of uh, uh, a series of transformations, uh, the virus RNA can then integrate into the host DNA of the T cells and they can generate new viral RNAs, uh, which can lead to the formation of a new merger round. And you can also this the formation of the ember trimer on these host T cells. So why we think that our uh, CD4 mechanic have the potentials to uh, eradicate all the virus in our body. So normally this the uh, viral entries, you can open a series of combination change of the uh, GP120 uh, from state one, state two to state three. And the state one is the close conformations, uh, which these three GP120 uh, is remain close and it can be found out in unactive or active virus. So with our CD for momentic, uh, we can trigger a state two way conformations and which can lead to uh, the ADCC, the antibody dependent 
several psychotoxicity, uh, which had potential to eradicate all the epigrams. So this is the secret opening of the binding with the CD4 mimetics. So this closed state one conformation, once it binds with our CD4 mimetic, uh, it can slightly change the conformation of the three GP1 subunit and open the binding site with the corresponding uh, anti-corresponding binding site antibody, I'll show in black over here, and gradually change the conformation and expose the epimol that can be recognized by the, this antibody, uh, anti-cluster A antibody. And once this antibody cluster A binds to the uh, GP1 it can reach the state 2A. And this anti-cluster anti A antibody uh, is a suitable target for the natural cells in our body and you can recount them by these natural cells and trigger the ADTC process to eradicate this virus or infected cells. <clears throat> uh, so now with the, our CD4 medic can uh, have the potential to kill the uh, infected or HIV virus, uh, it can also protect it, uh, our healthy cells. So in normal situations, uh, these infected cells uh, can shed off the GP1 on the surface and generate this uh, GP1 anti monomers just floating down your blood. And this, this free GP1 anti can then bind by your uh, CD4 receptor of your healthy cells. And the further binding of a suitable antibody can be recognized, recognized by your natural killer cells. And then this, net, uh, this healthy cell will then be eradicated by the natural killer cells. So with our CD4 mimetic, we can now only uh, trigger the ADCC process. Uh, this floating GB1 anti monomers can be bind with our CD4 mimetic. And so these monomers can now able to bind with uh, the CD4 receptors on our healthy cells and uh, prevent it from recognized by the natural killer cells. Uh, so <clears throat> The small molecular uh, start from uh, the screaming result of the more than 15,000 compounds and give us the HCS heat showing over here, uh, obtained by Dr. Debney from the New York Black Center. And after almost two decades of uh, engineering and ACR study, uh, our Smith School obtained uh, one of the current compound BN3170. And as you can see, the bioactivity uh, tape test able over here, uh, our BM3170 targeted a different strain of clade of HIV virus, uh, which showed pretty good IC50 value uh, from 11 micromoles to around 1 micromoles. And its NLB is a parameter uh, shows that if it's our BM3170, it's specific towards the virus. So the number is higher, means that our compound is more specific towards the virus. <clears throat> And this compound is first synthesized uh, in 2016 by Dr. Mario, our former members. And it can be attained by fifteen step uh, with 6.2 overall yield. But uh, every step needs the, almost every step in the synthesis requires column purifications. And because of the growing interest in our bioactivity, testing of bioactivity and animal study of our, with our collaborators, uh, a more efficient and scalable synthesis is needed. So this is the second scale of synthesis of the BN3170, uh, published in 2019 before I joined the group. And also my first project to uh, synthesize about 10 grand of this box, uh, BN3170 for our biotesting. And this synthesis is uh, 16 step and around 10% yield. And only one column purification, uh, which is the base stage coordinations, uh, is needed. Uh, however, uh, this four synthesis is pretty time consuming. Uh, some of the steps step takes uh, more than two days, three days. So it takes about almost two months to complete the whole synthesis. And uh, because, although, although this can generate like multi grains of BN3170, start with 20 grains of starting material, uh, we still need more efficient synthesis uh, because our collaborator has 
increasing their interest in, in this compound over the years. So you, we need about 50 grand a year. So it takes like six months to seven months for us to prepare that much of compound. So this leads to our my next project. Uh, sorry about uh, So you can see that uh, there are some steps are pretty lengthy. Uh, it takes four steps to install the uh, turbidal carbon main amino group, the five positions, and it takes about five steps, uh, four steps to install the grounding at the two positions. Uh, so this leads to my next project. Uh, it's the development of the concise synthesis. Uh, and work with, I work with uh, Dr. Higgins, uh, Dr. Dr. Higgins in our groups, uh, who is now moving forward to the industry. So we now currently develop this uh, concise synthesis of BN3117, uh, picture of Nikishi Kapoin, uh, transfer, and going agent uh, to keep this synthesis with nice step in 8.44% yield. Uh, low is pretty uh, time saving, takes about two weeks to complete the whole synthesis. Uh, there are some steps that can improve in terms of yield, like this Aza Michael series, and the last step of coordination, uh, uh, which is which are what I'm currently working on. So uh, these are our collaborators, and that's what I'm going to present today. Thank you. Thank you so much. It looks like you work really, really, really hard, and um, I'm getting lots of products. So congratulations on that. Do we have any questions for uh, to Joan? So what sort of improvements or plans are to optimize those two steps that you mentioned at the end? Uh, so uh, so follow the list azo micro reactions. Uh, I've tried different metal salts and solvent, uh, but I haven't tried different nucleophile yet because this turbidal back complement is pretty weak nucleophile. And maybe I will change to a uh, different nucleophile, like uh, ethyl carbon may or benzoyl carbon may is probably a better, slightly better, slightly stronger nucleophile compared to these species. And also, I'm planning doing, um, or I'm currently working on uh, switching the route, uh, starting from uh, using the starting materials to work uh, straight the olefin agent to put the olefin here and do the ASAP reactions. And then do a Nikishi later. Uh, this is a plan currently trying to do on. And for the last step, uh, because we only tried this step once, so we have to taste more to see if it is uh, efficiency enough to enhance the yield. Maybe we have to work on the procedure because after the combination, we can get pretty high yield, about 80% yield. But once the TFA woke up, uh, the yield dropped to 37%. And because uh, we didn't uh, use the TFA like drop wise in uh, this procedure that we tried, and we saw some uh, decomposition in the in our previous exam uh, experience in our uh, old synthesis. That if you add TFA uh, too quick, it may decompose this compound. So maybe we have we have to improve this workout procedure a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, good luck on the next step, next steps moving forward. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your project with us. Um, our next presenter, it's still, it's Yimeng Law, and he also did a project in organic chemistry. He worked uh, under the mentorship of David Gish, Gish Kariani, please correct me if I said that last name incorrect, I apologize, at the CNSC Center. So to Jun, just like, I mean, I'm sorry, Yimeng, just take it away. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yimeng Luo, and I'm working in the CNSC. Uh, the title of my capsule project is Amino Acid Based Dendromers as Soft Nanomaterials for Biorelevant Application. 
Um, to start the poster, I would like to first talk about um, what is dendrimers. Um, dendrimers are tree-like brain structures that can be synthesized in a sequential manner. The first structure was reported by Fritz and Vogel in 1978, which they referred the process as cascade synthesis. Uh, generally, um, dendrimer can be divided to three parts, uh, including the core branch unit and service group, which is shown in the figure. On the right side of the figure, uh, there are several uh, widely studied dendritic structures and some of them are commercially available. So to synthesize the dendritic macromolecule, there are two uh, commonly used uh, methods, including divergent and convergent synthesis. For divergent synthesis, the method builds the structure from the inner sphere to the outer sphere. So starting from the innermost uh, structure core, by adding the branch unit, the structure can reach to next generation. And by repeating this step, uh, the reaction can provide the targeted size and generation of the product. So for convergent synthesis, um, this method builds the structures uh, in the opposite direction comparing to divergent synthesis. The, the reactions start from the uh, branch unit and the surface group to form segment. And this segment will react to more branching unit to form a larger segment. And at the last step, these larger segment will bind with the core to form the um, uh, dendrimer. So among all the um, dendritic structures, the polylysine dendrimer are uh, the most biocompatible as their degraded product is uh, non-toxic amino acid lysine. With a suitable surface group, uh, the polylysine dendrimer can be used as a inhibitor, HIV inhibitor. So, however, um, due to the issues with the synthesis, the molecule higher than generation four have never been tested. Uh, moving to experimental design, uh, the current method for the polylysine dendrimer synthesis is able to achieve up to generation five. But uh, structure only up to, uh, only up to generation four has been successfully converted into functional molecules. The reason lies in the steric bias between the alpha and epsilon amino groups on the lysine. The, uh, the alpha amino groups is significantly more shielded, uh, which increased the difficulties for the branch unit to bind uh, with the amine group uh, during the uh, reaction. Um, so in the figure, uh, it is the uh, detailed uh, synthetic route of the polylysine dendrimer, starting from the core unit, um, compound six, by reacting with the branching unit, uh, compound three, it will reach to um, next uh, generation one products, uh, which will then undergo deprotection reaction to form compound eight. So basically, uh, the synthesis can be divided to two repeating steps. Uh, uh, the protection and the growth step. In the deprotection step, uh, the protecting group will be removed uh, usually under acidic condition. Uh, and in the growth step, the deprotected uh, dendrimer will react with the branch unit to form a next generation product. So for the result, um, to, uh, this project focused on the development of new pathway by introducing another amino acid in a branch unit with the lysine in order to balance the steric bias between alpha and epsilon amino groups. Uh, the divergent method is utilized uh, including two repeating steps, a growth and the protection step. Um, to date, uh, this approach um, has achieved the synthesis up to generation six with the molecule weight uh, around 38,000 Dalton. And uh, currently I'm still working on getting a higher generation products. So for the characterization, um, NMR, GPC, and MODI are utilized to, for the determination of the structure. Um, due to the large molecules of higher generation product, NMR can only provide uh, limited information. That's why we need a uh, MODI to confirm the molecular weight of the sample and GPC to uh, 
uh, provide the information of the purity of each molecule. So in the figure, uh, it is the GPC data. Um, the X axis uh, represent the retention time and the Y axis uh, represent the intensity of the signal. So the figure shows a clear shift toward low retention time from the core G0 um, to G6 indicates, uh, indicates the increased size and hydrodynamic volume of the dendromer. So for conclusion, uh, this method is able to provide a high generation uh, dendritic structure up to generation six uh, with high reaction yields uh, ranging from 70 to 90%. And during the purification process, no column is needed. Also, the method is allowed. Uh, the method allows the multiple amino acid analog to be synthesized. Uh, for the future plan, we plan to uh, establish the procedure for the service group modification. Based on the literature study on polylysine dendrimers, uh, with a, a suitable surface group, uh, the polylysine dendrimers is able to. Uh, Show some in you show some anti-HIV activity, and we are trying to figure it out if the if the the synthesized compound in this project also shows um, similar property towards the HIV uh, virus. Um, that's all for my presentation. Uh, I'm happy to answer the question. Great work. Uh, thank you for that. I forgot to mention that Yimeng will be joining the, PH, the chemistry PhD program at Ohio State University. So congratulations on that. Yay. Thank so you. questions uh, for Yimeng. Um, yeah, I had a quick question. So like um, in the results section, you show that table. Um, can you explain like why all the peaks are um, are at one? Okay. So you mean the GPC data, right? Yes. So um, uh, so in here there are like uh, data from the uh, GPC and uh, different color represent the uh, different uh, generation of the products. So actually they are like different. Uh, data, but I just combine them to in one figure to show that there's a clear shift of the changing intention, retention time. So GPC separate the um, molecules uh, by the size of the, the sample. So larger uh, structure will come out earlier and the smaller structure will come out slow, uh, will have a longer retention time. So. Uh, starting from the core, like G0, uh, which is shown as an orange line, and then G1, and then up to G6. I was trying to um, show that uh, the structure is growing bigger and bigger, uh, and uh, that's how we determine that uh, the dendromer reaction is finished and uh, grow to the expected size. Uh, does that answer your question? I think so. Um, Christopher, yeah. did, did that answer your question? Um, I guess my question was more on the y-axis because the y-axis represents intensity. So here I see that all of the peaks are at one. So I guess, does that mean the, the intensity is one for every single generation that you uh, detected? Uh, actually, uh, the intensity represents the total amount of the chemical you injected into the HPLC. So in here, I'm not really concerned about the, the amount of molecule I injected into. Uh, okay. So I did the normalization to make it like looks at mm -hmm. the, at the, as the high, uh, same uh, intensity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So how does this, your methods compare to analogous uh, methods to generate um, bigger molecules? So, uh, so normally, uh, den dendromer synthesis only include like uh, one uh, specific amino acid. Mm -hmm. So in here, we include like two and try to balance the stir bias, like the at the um, alpha amino groups. It will uh, by in by introducing another amino acid, it will become like longer, far from the core 
which will reduce the steric hindrance uh, okay. of the, the amino group. Yeah, that's how, that's the different part. Yeah. Well, impressive work. I know working with this large molecules are very, very challenging. So thank you for sharing your work with us. Yeah. Um, our next presenter, it's going to be uh, Brian Gillespie. Are you around here? Brian? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Okay, so Brian completed, Brian actually is a lawyer who's completing our um, our program. So we're very impressed that, that he can do that. And he's been doing this part-time, but he's graduating at the same time as full-time students. So kudos to like more impressive work uh, towards what you've done. And um, he completed his capstone under Professor Ricardo Gotardi at Penn Medicine. And his work is actually a literature review. Um, so I'm just gonna let you take it away um, and, and share your project with us. All right. Uh... Uh, it, as uh, Anna Rita said, my name is Brian Gillespie, and I completed my lit review uh, in conjunction with the Gotardi uh, Bioengineering and Biomaterials Lab uh, over at Penn Medicine, specifically with uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So our research focused on the treatment of uh, subglottic stenosis, which um, is a disease caused by a hyperactivation of uh, certain pathways. Uh, that lead to scarring in the airway. Um, so why is this a problem? Uh, I guess two years ago, I probably wouldn't have to explain why having trouble, why I would have to explain why having trouble breathing is, is a problem. Um, but I think that uh, recent events have kind of brought to light why uh, this, can, this can be a problem, especially in pediatric patients. Um, currently, there are no uh, treatments to prevent uh, the development of stenosis. Instead, there are only treatments to manage symptoms. Um, so as you can see here, uh, this is what stenosis looks like in vivo. So we have a 3D rendering as well as an X-ray rendering. And you can see kind of the top of the bottom uh, of the airway kind of the normal diameter. Um, and then you can also see uh, that, that narrowing. Um, so the key question that the lab is trying to solve is if it's possible to locally deliver a minimally invasive therapy to prevent the development of LTS in the first place, to so prevent that scarring. Um, and why is this a problem? So LTS is caused primarily, so not over 90% of the cases, by an airway injury. Um, a lot of this is intubation. And just to kind of put that, put a face on it, intubation is required in many of the over 20,000 premature births among other um, disorders as well. Uh, that takes place in the United States, and up to 21% of intubated patients are at risk of developing stenosis, so developing that scar tissue with leads to that, that narrowing. Um, unfortunately, there is no safe period for how long somebody can be intubated. Um, in adults, there is some leeway, so between uh, seven to 10 days, um, but with pediatric patients, there is no safe window. So chemically, um, what causes stenosis? So there, an injury takes place um, and blood rushes to the, in, to the injured site. Um, blood releases a, a chemical called PGF beta, um, and, which is responsible for kicking off the, the healing pathway. Uh, PGF beta molecules, uh, specifically an isoform called PGF beta one, binds to receptors on cell membranes, uh, PGF beta one receptors, and those activate what we call the SNAD23 pathway. Um, the SNAD23 pathway is responsible for healing, uh, the healing process. So uh, specifically, it activates fibrotic genes, and these fibrotic genes are responsible for collagen production, fibroblast proliferation. Unfortunately, when there is a hyperactivation of this SNAD23 pathway, uh, there is excess tissue fiber tissue, uh, fibrotic tissue, which causes this scarring in the airway. So that is what leads to these results. So as I mentioned, currently there is no treatment to prevent uh, stenosis. Um, there are ways to mitigate existing symptoms, uh, 
app. And those range from highly efficacious to high risk uh, to low efficacy. Um, and right at the top, you can see that the, the most invasive, but the most effective way is surgical reconstruction. So going in with a scalpel or a laser, digging out that scar tissue and rebuilding the, the damage crater. Uh, less effective is our mechanical me mechanism. Like, uh, like a balloon dilation. So going in and just physically inflating a site um, or putting in a stent to mechanically support a site. And finally, there have been some drugs to hopefully make things worse. Uh, or sorry, uh, not as bad, but a lot of the drugs have been, um, they, again, they don't prevent the, the hyperactivation of that SMAD 2 3 pathway. So they don't prevent the development of stenosis in the first place. Um, instead, they uh, hopefully can treat some symptoms, but there's been some experimentation with drugs to prevent stenosis in, um, in the past. And some of those have had mixed results in humans. Um, and some of them have proved to be actually pretty dangerous. Some uh, promising candidates have been um, actually carcinogenic. carcinogenic. Um, so we definitely don't want to use those. So there's definitely a need um, in the market. And the, the lab thought that you know applied biochemistry or biological biological chemistry is a way to uh, directly um, approach the problem in a way that no one else is. So instead of focusing on a mechanical approach um, that alleviates symptoms after the fact, we want to focus on a chemical approach to prevent the dysfunction from occurring in the first place. So going back to that pathway, um, so TGF beta one pathway and tissue healing. Um, again, that's it's TGF beta one is a pathway that's used throughout the body for to kick off the healing process. Um, TGF beta one um, stimulates kind of extracellular matrix production. Um, but unfortunately, uh, TGF beta 1 is also associated with, um, it, it also aggregates in there. So that can lead to kind of this feedback loop where there is uh, there's more TGF beta 1 that gets produced, released by the body, produced, leading to that hyperactivation um, that leads to fibrosis in the first place. Um, so the idea is that because the, this hyperactivation is what leads to uh, fibrosis, um, if we can stop the hyperactivation, then we can stop the fibrosis from taking place. So the idea is to use a TGF beta one inhibitor uh, to to help that to help the healing process, or to help um, prevent stenosis during the healing process, to prevent that abnormal healing process from taking place. So in this ideal situation, we have the injury take place. TGF beta one is still released from platelets that gather at the injured site. Um, TGF beta does get released uh, to kick off this healing cascade in the body. However, uh, this TGF beta 1 inhibitor um, acts as a competitive inhibitor, um, binding uh, using kind of a, a serine 280 residue that mimics uh, the natural TGF beta 1 binding site or a binding ligand. Um, to competitively bind to those receptors to prevent hyperactivation. Um, so what the end result is, is uh, lower activation. And with that lower activation, you do not have as much um, SMAD 2 3 activity. And consequently, you do not have, um, you do not have that collagen production, that fibroblast proliferation, and therefore that excess fibrotic tissue. And hopefully you have fewer people um, dealing with uh, stenosis in the first place, especially those pediatric patients who are at a much higher risk. Um, and again, uh, the, as I mentioned before, TGF beta is important throughout the whole body. Um, so one of the considerations is um, low, is delivery. So in the in the biological chemical in the biological chemistry side of things, we want to make sure that we are focusing um, what we do to avoid off-target effects. Um, here, because TGF beta is involved in healing processes throughout the entire body. Um, we want to make sure that this inhibitor goes to the right site so that we're not impairing uh, any other normal biological functions, including um, something that may have brought somebody into the hospital in the first place to require that intubation. So we want to locally deliver uh, this inhibitor uh, in, the, in the airway uh, using a biodegradable stent. That way, um, we can provide structural support if that structure is needed to 
currently that's something that chemistry can't do alone. Um, we're able to provide a sustained delivery of the inhibitor over time. Um, so whether it could be it could be a short term period, so a couple months, it could be up to a year. Um, we're able to, to tailor that relief profile. Um, and then finally, the stent will degrade over time. So at the end of the therapy, that will kind of prevent any issues that might come with stent removal. Um, and yeah, so again, we want structural support, we want the therapeutic agent, and this will be a first-in-class therapy to prevent LCS. Uh, I want to thank the lab, and that's, that's it. Thank you for your time. So thank you so much uh, for giving off like a very big overview of a very detailed work you've been doing. So uh, do we have any questions from the group? Uh, this is Ursula. I just have a quick question. It's an interesting talk. Um, so I know you're focused on local release, but um, has there been research to see if any of the drug has also been absorbed systemically? And you also said it breaks down over time, but I was wondering if you knew how long it takes to be metabolized. Okay. Um, sure. So do you mean just in general, do you, have we done research on the inhibitor uh, in, in, in vivo models? Um, yeah. Okay, uh, sure. So there's definitely been some research in small uh, animal models. Um, so in, in, in rats and mice, excuse me, um, to study some of that. And one of the reasons that uh, the lab wants to move forward is because things have looked promising in those models. There haven't been too many off-target effects yet with the local delivery, um, which has been handled mostly through microspheres. Um, but there has not been the same um, analysis on larger models. Um, and actually that was something that I was hoping to do uh, starting last summer. Um, but as Anna Marina helpfully mentioned kind of at the beginning of this whole process, um, we've had to make some adjustments just, be, just kind of because of COVID um, and everything's kind of got thrown off. That's why we were um, doing the research with you. So to answer your question, there haven't been as many studies on what the effects look like in large animal models or in people specifically with this inhibitor. Um, the lab is hoping to start doing that research and they are working with a team of surgeons um, in, at CHOP to actually get some pediatric tissue to start looking at what it will look like just kind of um, uh, in vitro. Um, but right now we're still waiting on building that data for those uh, large animal models so that we can show that this is a, a, safe, uh, a, safe, uh, a safe tool for treating, for treating and hopefully preventing the development of the dysfunction in the first place. Okay, thank you. Um, do you know what breaks down this compound in the body? How it's eliminated? Uh, yes. So, and I, and I'm. This is this. I guess an, an assumption on my part. So, um, if if we're just talking about the molecule on its own, um, then it's typically eliminated through uh, just kind of normal. Immune, immune function. So the it, it's a foreign agent in the body and it's removed um, it's kind of by the immune system flagging it as foreign and um, kind of removing it over time. There was some talk in the lab about doing some things to make the, the delivery system more biocompatible. Um, there was, for example, there was some talk about um, maybe using uh, microspheres or nanospheres to deliver everything, uh, maybe pegylating those spheres um, to make sure that the uh, I think the system wasn't recognizing the, body, uh, the uh, inhibitors and removing them. Um, but because we're, we chose kind of a stent approach, the, we're, we're just letting the immune system kind of carry away the, uh, the inhibitor molecules once, um, kind of once they get there, but just having that sustained release to keep uh, rep replenishing the supply um, as the uh, inhibitor gets naturally eliminated from the body. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for your questions, Ursula. He addressed many of the questions I had, so you did them for me. Thank you so much. Um, and um, our next presenter is uh, Stephen Lee, last but not least. 
And Stephen uh, completed his capstone on Professor Jeff Saban's mentorship at UPenn Chemistry. And he's doing a um, biophysical computational project. So we're looking forward to hear what he has to say. He will be looking for jobs in industry after his graduation. So, um, Stephen, are you are you around? Are you there, Brian? You're gonna have to stop sharing. Oh, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> sorry, it, it's showing me that I am not sharing. Um, but oh no. Um, okay. No. It, no, it's... Stephen is sharing. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Uh, okay. Hello everyone, I hope you had a good morning. So I joined Dr. Savings Jeffrey Lab here at Penn. My project focuses on using molecular dynamics to simulate positively supercharged GFP or green fluorescent protein in ferritin's interior and see where they interact. Positively supercharged here means that we took wild type GFP, which has a neutral charge and we mutated the residues until it has a desired positive charge while still maintaining is structure and function. In this case, we chose to have plus 36. Protein-protein host guest systems, where GFP here is the guest and ferritin is the host, have application in material sciences, drug delivery systems, chemical tools, and others. Um, the goal of this project is to find key residues on GFP that promotes free floating subunits of ferritin to assemble into its native spherical shape while encapsulating GFP in the process. This data will be shared with Dr. Mahoski's group here at Penn, and they will run it experimentally and it will help them aid in mutagenesis studies. And after we identify these residues on GFP, we can then apply this to other guest systems, such as other enzymes and nanoparticles. So a bit about the background. Ferritin is a ubiquitous protein found in all forms of life in eukaryotes. Its purpose is to sequester free iron and maintain homeostasis of iron concentration within the cell by acting as a storage unit and having the ability to release it when needed. Here we have ferritin. It's a composed of 24 subunits of tetrahelical bundles. Here is a subunit here with four alpha helical helix with a short fit helix hanging off at the end. And in its native form, it forms a spherical hollow cage which large triangular pores. And besides iron, people have been looking at repurposing ferritin to house other enzymes or particles. And this, this has been shown for an enzyme, human carbonic hydrides too. Oh, oops, sorry about that. And gold nanoparticles. Here we have a positive charged protein here with ferritin subunits here here in red to depict the negative charge. So the interior of ferritin is negatively charged, so it attracts positively charged proteins. By modulating the pH, we can have it in its disassemble form or in its assemble form here. But AFTN, a ferritin from a thermophilic species, can associate and disso dissociate, going from the dissociate form to the associated form by modulating the salt concentration. So this opens up a new avenue to induce encapsulation for pH sensitive guest proteins. So for the experimental designs, this is a pure computational work. So I took the structure of GFP plus 36 and AFT and ferritin from the protein database. I placed GFP 36 in the center of ferritin. The whole system is then placed in a water box filled with explicit water molecules so we can have an atomistic simulation and the simulation to mimic laboratory, laboratory conditions is run at 300 Kelvin and at one atmosphere. And this is maintained throughout the simulation. So I'll talk about the methodology and preliminary results. It's still a work in progress. So we first look at the time frame where GFP docks onto the ferritin. And we do that by looking at the movement of the center of mass of GFP throughout the simulation is this figure here. And we look for the region where the distance reaches an equilibrium point, which we define at this point, this point going on forward. This region will be used for analysis. 
So we take this region and then we take the alpha carbon of every residue on ferritin and calculate the distance to the alpha carbon on every residue in GFP per frame. So here we have around 45 nanoseconds that equates to around 2000 frames. So we did this analysis for starting at 20 nanoseconds, having a thousand frames for every pair of residue. Then we take the average across all the frames and then we made a contact map here based on the threshold, in this case, 10 angstroms. If the two residues are within 10 angstroms or less on average, then it'll show up as a color spot, which is barely visible right here on the contact map. Non-interacting pairs of residues greatly outnumber interacting pairs. So it's very common to see almost a colorless contact map like this. And then we plotted and then we plotted how often the residues are in contact throughout the trajectory. So every point here represents the pair of residues being under 10 angstrom for that frame. And we do this for the 20 nanoseconds to the end of the uh, simulation. This is to see you know, just the fluctuations between the pair, the pair of residues to see if one is stronger than the other and any potential misses where it could be in the first half that it didn't, there was no connection, but in the second half it did, and that will be missing the average contact map just over, just because how averaging works. And then every pair of residue, every pair is then visualize, visualize using VMD. So right here in this blue is ferritin, here in the gray black is GFP. I'll look at each pair of residues and identify the type of interaction they have. And then I'll we'll label it all and put in a table. This process, of, so this is just one iteration. This process will be repeated multiple times where GFP is in a different initial configuration. And this is just to see where GFP is biased towards on any side of the ferritin. Right now we're working on the sampling problem to collect sufficient data that's truly representative of the interaction while being efficient with compu computational time. And for preliminary data, we have shown, or it seems that GFP prefers the C-terminus of the ferritin. And this is good news since it makes sense why GF positive supercharged GFP helps ferritin self-assemble while in solution. And that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, especially explaining how you created the model to do the calculations. That was very insightful. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the group? So do you know what types of applications Ferritin will have in the Mohoski group? They are really interested in ferritin just as a protein itself. And then, so they want to understand how the application, how it can be used as a carrier. So it can deliver like fluorescence protein to the desired location. It can be as a drug delivery system carrying the drug of interest to any part of the body. And that's also because ferritin, the exterior is very stable so they can modulate it and add a ligand to the exterior so it can have better, reach the target better. Okay, well, thank you so much. Like I said, uh, your last but not least, um, <laughs> I also wanna mention that in, in the group today, we have Panky Mehta, she's also graduating. She completed her capstone. She's completing her capstone at the CNS um, C Center as well she is unable to present a poster because it has confidentiality issues they're looking to they cannot disclose but um she will be joining the university of delaware phd program congratulations um she is in the call if you have any questions or you can reach out to her like later um there you go panky <laughs> Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I we're very impressed with the work that all of you have done, especially being super flexible 
uh, during COVID, uh, both you and your faculty mentors, your research mentors, uh, they were able to to be able to, to provide a meaningful research experience during such uncertain times. So we wish you the best moving forward. Like I mentioned, we're gonna create a capstone page um, later on and the MCS Capstone Award will be um, um, announced on the Friday Chemistry Award Ceremony. So thank you again. Um, and thank you, Panky, for joining us um as well um if you have any final questions or comments feel free to do them at this time well if not thank you again for joining us and um have a great day or evening the depending where you are. Uh, thank you so much.